Hello, and welcome to the webinar on Introduction to HIV Evolution. My name is Cheryl Lockfemia, and I am an epidemiologist with the HIV Incidence and Case Surveillance Branch at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Our guest presenter for this webinar is Dr. Joel Wertheim, Assistant Professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the University of California, San Diego. Thank you. So today, I'll be speaking to you about an introduction to HIV evolution, specifically introducing HIV evolution in the context of molecular epidemiology to construct HIV transmission networks using a program that we've developed called HIV Trace. The purpose of this webinar is to help you go from this to this. And the question is how do we do this? The answer is HIV trace. The objectives of this talk are first to introduce you to the HIV genome, to help you gain a basic understanding of genetic sequence alignment and genetic distance calculation, and then using this information to understand the basic mechanics of HIV trace so that you will feel comfortable constructing HIV transmission networks. But first, a little background. We're going to go through some basics on HIV diversity, then we'll get to the HIV genome, then we'll touch on HIV sequence alignment, genetic distance calculation, and then finally we'll get to HIV trace. And by the time we get to HIV trace, it is my goal that it will seem simple and intuitive. HIV diversity. HIV-1 group M is the pandemic lineage of HIV. It, can be it is a remarkably diverse virus that can be classified into nine pure subtypes and dozen circulating recombinant forms. Many of the pure subtypes, A, B, C, D, and F, and their phylogenetic relationships to each other are shown here on this phylogenetic tree. Now, these subtypes and recombinant forms have been diverging from each other since the early 20th century, and almost all of them can be found in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where the pandemic is inferred to have originated. Uh, HIV-1 group M subtype B, shown in red, is the predominant subtype within the United States, where it is estimated to account for at least 95% of HIV-1 cases. HIV-1 group M likely originated from the simian immunodeficiency virus, or SIV, in chimpanzees. This virus is known as SIV-CPZ SIV or SIV-CPZ for those of you in Canada and the United Kingdom. And uh, it's believed to have originated from a specific population of chimpanzees in Cameroon. Now, other HIV-1 viruses, such as HIV-O, N, and P, are also are thought to have originated from related viruses found in chimpanzees and gorillas. Another SIV, this one found in a small African monkey known as the Sudi Mangabe, is responsible for HIV-2 and has jumped into humans on at least eight separate occasions. Two of these jumps have resulted in sustained human-to-human -human transmission, uh, which are known as HIV-2A and HIV-2B. So all in all, we have documented at least 12 independent jumps into humans from SIV in both apes and monkeys. Uh, since this jump uh, into humans, where HIV started diversifying around the turn of the 20th century, uh, we can, we've used phylogenetic techniques uh, to establish when and where HIV migrated throughout uh, uh, the world, starting in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, and then moving out uh, into North America through the Caribbean, and then from North America to the rest of uh, uh, Central America, and then into Europe and into Asia and Australia. And we've been able to do all of this uh, based on molecular uh, evolutionary analysis. And if we want to do molecular evolutionary analysis on HIV, we need to understand its genome. And in order to understand its genome, it helps to understand HIV's life cycle. 
Now, HIV is an RNA retrovirus. This means it starts its life cycle as an RNA virus. The virus particle then binds to, the, to most cells using the host receptor CD4 and either the CCR5 or CXCR4 co-receptor. Uh, co-receptor antagonists like Moravrock are able to block this binding. Uh, in the absence of drug, HIV then fuses with the host cell and excretes its RNA into the genome, it, uh, excretes its RNA genome into the cell. Now, fusion inhibitors act here to stop this part of the HIV life cycle. Uh, if, in the absence of these inhibitors, uh, the RNA is then reverse transcribed into DNA using a viral protein called reverse transcriptase, which then integrates into the host cell genome using a viral protein called integrase. Now, drugs such as drugs such as NRTIs and NNRTIs are effective at blocking the reverse transcription step, whereas uh, integrase inhibitors are uh, obviously effective at uh, blocking the integration step where HIV transitions from RNA to DNA. Uh, this DNA is then transcribed uh, and expressed uh, in the host cell genome where it is then where viral genes are then produced and packaged into uh, the virion particle uh, where the virus can then bud and then mature and is at this maturation step that protease inhibitors are most effective. Now, the HIV genome is made up of just four uh, component parts, which are uh, A, C, T, and G, much like all other genomes you've ever come across. Uh, A, adenine, C, cytosine, T, thymine, and G, guanine. Uh, when it's in its RNA form, of course, uh, uracil or U replaces the T. However, for the purposes of this talk, we'll use T and U interchangeably. Now, these bases are held together uh, by a phosphate backbone uh, to create DNA or RNA. Now, one of the earliest clues to how to fight HIV came from a basic understanding of these component parts, specifically uh, the development of AZT or the uh, thymine analog. Now, the fir this first treatment for HIV, AZT, took advantage of the fact that HIV needs to incorporate into the host genome. And by substituting uh, the T for a similar looking molecule, AZT, uh, we were able to uh, stop this reverse transcription process. Uh, now, cellular enzymes uh, would convert AZT uh, into its effective uh, form, and this would prevent uh, the addition of uh, nucleotides from being added, essentially stopping uh, reverse transcription of HIV and, in, and then subsequent incorporation into the host genome. Now this is the HIV genome. Uh, as you can see, there are nine genes uh, that occur often in overlapping regions, and these LTRs are long terminal repeats at either end of the genome. The main HIV genes are GAG, the structural protein, OMV, the outer membrane protein responsible for host cell recognition and binding, and POL, which encodes the protease, reverse transcriptase, and integrase. Now this is how I like to look at the HIV genome. It's kind of strange if you look at it like this, but this is 9,181 A's, T's, G's, and C's. All of it. This is the entirety of HIV. And the part that we're most interested in is just this uh, 1400 uh, little bit here that uh, is often sequenced in HIV surveillance. Now this little piece of the HIV genome encodes protease and part of the reverse transcriptase gene. And this is the region that we're interested in. Now why are we interested in this region? Well, that drug resistance I mentioned earlier uh, is, is often encoded here, specifically uh, protease inhibitors, the NRTIs and the NNRTIs that are actively surveilled within the United States and around the world. And the reason that these HIV genomes uh, or genomic segments were first acquired in the, in the first place, to identify and track uh, the prevalence of uh, antiretroviral resistance in the population. 
Now, just to give you a very brief uh, background on where these sequences come from, uh, it's done through a process known as Sanger sequencing, uh, where fluorescent tags are added to a mixture uh, of the HIV uh, genomic region, and that when these fluorescent tags are added to the mixture, uh, they light up, and the order in which they light up uh, lets you know uh, which nucleotide comes next in the sequence. So essentially, you're monitoring it for light flashes where you can see blue, blue, green, blue, lets you know that you have CCAC. Then red pops up and you get red, uh, T, and black uh, lets you know that you've encountered a G. Of course, the HIV genome uh, is actually being done on a uh, population of viruses, uh, where this sequencing for surveillance is being done on a population of viruses. And therefore, we may actually have uh, a mixture of different uh, nucleotides at a single position. So you can have blue, blue, green, and then simultaneously you'll see blue and black, which lets you know that at that position you have a C and a G. Or, as you see later in this genome, you have G, G, A, and then a mixture of green and black, which lets you know that you have a mixture there that we can uh, call an R, which is just code for A and G. And before we get any further into understanding the HIV genome, I just wanted to pause for a little bit of terminology. Now we're going to talk about mutations. And a mutation is a change to DNA or RNA. And there are three types of mutations that we're going to be concerned with today. The first is a substitution. And this is a chemical change from one nucleotide to another. A to C, A to T, G to A, G to T, etc. Then we have a deletion, which is the loss of one or more nucleotides from the sequence. And these, and these, uh, and both the substitutions, deletions, and then subsequent insertions, or the addition of one or more nucleotides, comes from errors in the uh, viral polymerase. Essentially, the HIV reverse transcriptase is very error prone. Uh, and will very often, actually at least once per replication cycle, uh, result in uh, substitutions that change one nucleotide to another, or these insertions and deletions. Now there's one more um, uh, term that I'd like to call your attention to, and that's the other meaning for substitution, uh, which is a mutation that reaches fixation or 100% in a population. Now, this term is uh, reserved for uh, substitutions in population genetics. So today, when we talk about substitutions, we're going to be referring to it in the mutation context or the change of one nucleotide uh, to another. Now, let's take a look at evolution in action. We start uh, with our baseline sequence. Now, to reconstruct viral evolution dynamics, it's important to understand uh, how the virus evolves and what that evolution actually looks like. So, after some given uh, period of time has passed, uh, or one genomic replication cycle, we could have a single mutation, in this case, going from G to A. And you can see that here with the red arrow. If we zoom in, you can get a better look. So, whereas before we had a G, now we have an A. And then as time passes, we can have another subsequent mutation. And this new mutation will occur in the sequence uh, now we go from T to C, it will occur in the sequence where we already had that previous mutation. So now we have two mutations separating our current sequence from the first one, T to C and G to A. Now as the time passes and the mutational process continues, we get more mutations and more mutations, and eventually we can have, say, in this case, 10 mutations. And our, these sequences start to look quite divergent from one another. But if we look at all of these 10 steps side by side, it's very easy to see the path on which evolution occurred. Now, it gets complicated when we're missing these intermediate sequences, and we have to go from one sequence to another one that's 10 nucleotides divergent, and it's not necessarily as easy to reconstruct the path of evolution. Now, HIV evolves remarkably fast, around 10 to the minus 3 substitutions per site per year in the poll gene. So, over the course of someone's infection, we can see quite a lot of divergence. Uh, 
within within a given individual. Furthermore, if we have say two people, uh, the source uh, individual and a recipient who uh, was infected with a virus from the source, uh, mutations are actually going to occur twice as fast. And the reason for that, you can see here, is that substitutions will occur along both branches in a tree. So the base of this tree, you can see, is the ancestral source virus. And between that source virus that actually transmitted to the recipient, you can see that we would have three substitutions, C to T, A to G, and T to C. But of course, during this same period of time, the virus will have continued to evolve in the source uh, individual, where you have five other substitutions, A to T, G to A, G to A, A to G, and C to T. Now, all of these substitutions we're presuming at occurring at different sites in the HIV genome. And therefore, the source and the recipient viruses will differ uh, at eight substitutions. Now, all of this would actually be pretty easy to reconstruct if we only had to deal with these substitutions. But we also encounter insertions and deletions, which can, which can make it very hard to determine evolutionary history. You can see here two viruses from two different individuals where we have some insertions and deletions separating them. And the difficulty is that it can be very different, uh, difficult to determine which substitutions occurred when you have insertions and deletions. And the reason for that is shown here, where we could have a deletion uh, between sequence one and two, and then a mutation going from T to C. However, it's also possible that the deletion occurred in a different part of the genome, and the mutation should actually have been from GAA to CAA. And therefore, we need to reconstruct uh, the evolutionary history somehow. But before we get to that, I would just like to summarize really the only bits that you need to remember uh, from uh, the, the section on HIV genome is first, the genome is composed of A's, C's, T's, and G nucleotides. And that there are three main types of mutations. There are substitutions, which change a nucleotide, deletions, which remove nucleotides, and insertions, which add nucleotides. Now we get to alignment. Now aligning sequences is what we have to do in order to understand uh, which events happen in evolutionary history. In order to make this comparison, we need to know which parts of the HIV genome, specifically which nucleotide positions, correspond between viral strains. Now, sometimes it's pretty easy to align sequences. And you can see that here, where we just have to add this, we need to insert one gap uh, underneath the T in dummy sequence one, and now we have aligned sequences, where the evolutionary history here is now very clear. Now, in some genomic regions, uh, insertions and deletions make alignment very tricky. What I'm showing you here is the diversity within, within the HIV envelope, or OMV gene, across uh, the major uh, subtypes and circulating recombinant forms of HIV-1 group M. Now, not only is there a lot of diversity within HIV-1 uh, OMV, but there are an extraordinarily large number of insertions and deletions, which can make al alignment a very tricky problem. Uh, so it can be very difficult to uh, reconstruct the evolutionary history within the envelope gene. However, I have good news for you. HIV surveillance is primarily concerned with pull, specifically the protease and uh, RT reverse transcriptase region. Now, this polymerase gene has uh, less diversity than all, but more importantly, there are effectively no common insertions or deletions across the major subtypes of or circulating recombinant forms of HIV-1 group N. Now, what this means is that alignment is going to be very, very easy because we don't have to deal with uh, biological insertions and deletions, all we have to deal with are sequencing errors and making sure that all of our sequences are starting at the same point. Now, there are a whole lot of ways to do sequence alignments. And one of the more common ones is to do multiple sequence alignments. 
Now this aligns all sequences against all sequences. And like I indicated, there are countless algorithms for performing this type of uh, sequence alignment. But many of them require multidimensional analyses. Uh, because you have to compare all against all, more and more sequences take longer and longer to align. Uh, if you have 10 sequences and you add one more sequence, it doesn't make it just 10% harder uh, be because you now need to do alignments against every other sequence. Now, HIV surveillance genotypes are numerous, but they have relatively few insertions or deletions, which means we can cheat. We can do something known as pairwise sequence alignment. Uh, in this case, all sequences will be aligned against a single reference sequence. Uh, for uh, the program that we use, HIV Trace, we align all of our sequences against the HXP2 reference sequence. Now, this was the original HIV isolate from France in, 19, in 1983, uh, which I showed to you uh, earlier in this talk, all 9,181 nucleotides of it, which I assume you memorized when I showed you the slide, so you should be able to align any sequence to it yourself. Now the benefit of pairwise sequence alignment is that it's computationally efficient. In this case, 100 sequences only takes 10 times longer than 10 sequences, because for every sequence you only have to do one action, and that's align it against the reference HXB2. Now this method is ideal when the region being analyzed has very few insertions or deletions which, fortunately for us, uh, describes HIV uh, surveillance sequences. Now, in HIV poll, we can also take advantage of another feature to improve our alignments even more, and this is codon structure. And you might be asking yourself, what is a codon? Well, a codon is a series of three nucleotides, A's, T's, G's, and C's, that tell the cell which amino acid to place next in the protein. The and you can see the codon here, A, A, A. Now, the molecule responsible for telling uh, the cell uh, which amino acid that codon corresponds with is known as the tRNA. And it builds proteins by reading the gene sequence three nucleotides at a time. And every time it reads another codon, it adds an amino acid to this growing peptide or amino acid chain. So you can see UGG adds tryptophan, then lysine, then asparagine, then phenylalanine, all based on these three nucleotide uh, codes known as codons. Now, we know which codon goes with which letter based on this, which is the codon table. And if you look at this codon table, what you can see is that it's not random. Now, here are all 61 codons uh, encoded by amino acids. Uh, and you have uh, each of the three nucleotides that correspond with each codon, 61 for amino acids, and three, UAA, UAG, and UGA, are stop codons, which would tell uh, the ribosome that it's time to stop making a protein and it's finished. Now, for example, here, uh, you can see an example codon, uh, proline, which is encoded by four different codons. Now, all of these codons are related because they all only differ in this third position. So if you have CCU, CCC, CCA, or CCG, all of those codons all encode for proline. which means we can now use the structure of these codons to improve our alignment. Now, what you can see here are two possible alignments of HIV sequences. One of them, uh, we're required to have uh, a mutation, uh, a substitution going from T to G. So within a codon, GTT to GGT. However, we could also have another version of this alignment where we don't keep codon structure and we have no substitutions. So G to G and T all line up together. However, we've broken the codon structure of our alignment, which means that the subsequent uh, amino acid uh, protein uh, 
would very likely be broken in order to produce this type of alignment. Therefore, we can prefer the alignment that preserves codon structure. A pairwise sequence alignment in HIV trace, as I mentioned, all sequences are first aligned to the reference sequence HXB2. And to perform this, uh, we use a modified version of the Smith-Waterman Waterman algorithm, which considers uh, codons and HIV substitution preferences in the alignment. Now, this is uh, very efficient for large numbers of sequences, like we have in uh, HIV surveillance. Now, to summarize the alignment section of this talk, first, alignments help us know where mutations occurred in the genome. Pairwise alignment to a reference sequence is very fast, and codon structure helps us improve the alignment. Well, these are the only three things that you really need to take away from this section in order to understand how HIV trace is working. Which brings us to genetic distance. Now, before we continue, just another terminology slide. First, percent identity. Percent identity is a term you may have heard before, and it's fairly intuitive. It's just the percentage of sites where two, nu where two sequences have the same nucleotide. You just count up the number of sites in your genomic region, count up the number that are identical, and that's your percent identity. There's also genetic distance. Now, this is a term you also may have heard and may think it's the same as percent identity, but in fact, there's a subtle difference between the two. Now, genetic distance is the number of substitutions per site that separate two sequences. So instead of looking at identity, you're measuring distance. And we'll get into the difference in a little bit. But before that, I wanted to just address one more term, and that's homology. Now, homology is evidence of common evolutionary descent. And what I'd like you to take away from this is that it's not percent identity, and these two terms cannot be used interchangeably. Something cannot be 95% homologous or 50% homologous. You are either homologous, where you have evidence of a common evolutionary descent, or you are not homologous, and you don't have evolution, uh, evidence of that evolutionary descent. Now, to use these three terms, uh, you can think about it like this. Typical subtype B pole sequences are 95% identical. That's how we would describe percent identity. If you wanted to say something similar using genetic distance, you would say typical subtype B pole sequence, sequences are 0 0.05 substitutions per site divergent. And if you wanted to talk about HIV pole in terms of homology, you could say that HIV pole, pole in HIV1 is homologous with pole in SIV CPZ. Now, as I mentioned, sometimes percent identity and genetic distance are the same thing. For example, here we have one substitution going from our top sequence with a G, one substitution a C, and our bottoms, and now we end up with our new sequence. Now, this sequence is 10 nucleotides long, and we've had one substitution in it. Therefore, genetic distance is 1 over 10, or 0.1 substitutions per site. And the percent identity here is 90% because 9 out of 10 of these sites are identical between both sequences. However, sometimes percent identity and genetic distance are not the same thing. Now, for example, here we can have multiple substitutions at the same site. So we go from a G to an A, and then before we sample our second sequence, we have another substitution where that A goes to a C. And if we know the entire evolutionary history here, we can say that the genetic distance is 0.2 substitutions per site because we've had two substitutions in a region that is 10 nucleotides long, so 0.2 substitutions per site. However, percent identity is 90% because 9 out of 10 of these sequences are identical. Another way that genetic distance and percent identity can be different is the process of reversion, where you go from a G to an A, and then before you sequence again, you're back to a G. Now, that's two substitutions per, uh, over 10 sites, so, that, so the genetic distance between these two sequences is 0.2 substitutions per site. However, the genetic identity is 100%. So therefore, we don't want 
to conflate percent identity with genetic distance, even though, as I'll show you in a little bit, very often uh, they're very similar. Now, a question that I often get asked when talking about multiple substitutions and reversions is how often do HIV sequences uh, converge so that they're completely identical again? And the answer is, well, they don't. And the reason they don't is because every single site in a genomic region acts as sort of an independent um, dimension along which, along which HIV can evolve. So you can think about this is that every time you have a substitution or an insertion or a deletion, you're going to move away from a different sequence in a new dimension. So although you may converge at a couple of sites, if your sequence is long enough, they're just going to keep uh, diverging indefinitely until they look random relative to another. And sort of a metaphor you can, you can use to think about this is that the expanding universe, is that even though galaxies are expanding, the distance between them is also expanding. So they're constantly going to be moving away from each other in a, big, in a bigger separate dimension. And they'll never converge uh, into one another. It's a grand metaphor to essentially say you're not going to see two HIV sequences in two different people that have diverged from one another converge to be the identical sequence. It's just not going to happen. Now, in order to understand uh, the number of substitutions that have occurred uh, within uh, an H between two HIV genetic sequences, we like to use a substitution model. And the reason we use a substitution model is that it corrects for multiple hits and reversions. Now, what I've been showing you here is a plot of simulated sequences that simulate genetic distance on the x-axis, and then inferring that genetic distance on the y. Now, if we infer the genetic distance using something like percent identity, as you can see, as the simulated genetic distance gets longer and longer and longer, we start to undercount multiple hits and reversion events, which means we're going to underestimate the total amount of evolution that has occurred if we only look at percent identity. However, if we use a substitution model, which accounts for multiple hits and reversions, our simulated genetic distance and our inferred genetic distance line up perfectly. Therefore, we're going, to, we're going to use a substitution model to estimate the distance between HIV sequences. Now, a little secret that I have to admit to you because it's the truth, is that a really, really low genetic distances, say less than 0.1 substitutions per site or less than 0.05 substitutions per site or 5% identity, um, genetic distance and percent identity are really, really similar. And they're going to be even more similar at the genetic distances that we're concerned with in HIV molecular epidemiology, which is about 1.5% divergence, or 0 0.015 substitutions per site diversion. But because HIV trace is robust, we're still going to use the genetic substitution model. Now, there's one more little problem that crops up in HIV sequences, and you may have noticed this when you memorized all 9,181 nucleotides in the HXP2 reference genome. You may have noticed that A, T, G, and C don't all occur at the same frequency. In fact, A's occur at 36% of sites in the HIV genome, whereas C's only comprise 18% of the genome. Now, the reason for this uh, has to do uh, not only with uh, codon structure, but also biases um, in uh, HIV reverse transcriptase. Uh, and what's important here is that because A's, T's, C's, and G's don't all occur at the same frequency, uh, we need uh, to build a model uh, that allows them to be not random. Another thing that we need to uh, consider when reconstructing HIV genetic distances is that there are two classes of nucleotides. Uh, we have adenine and guanine, which are known as purines, 
and cytosine and thiamine, which are known as pyrimidines. Now, I'm not saying you need to memorize uh, which uh, nucleotides are purines and which are pyrimidines, but um, as I learned in my freshman genetics class, a helpful mnemonic would be angels are pure or AG purines. Get it? It's not that helpful or funny, but it actually, uh, all these years later, I, I still remember which uh, nucleotides are purines based on that. Now, all you need to know here is that purines are much bigger than pyrimidines because they have two ring structures instead of just one. Now, this is important when we want to uh, understand uh, HIV nucleotide substitutions because there are essentially two different types of substitutions. There are transitions, which go from purine to purine. That's A to G, G to A, C to C. To A. Or you can have transitions between pyrimidine to pyrimidine. That's T to C or C to T. Now, these are favored by the mutational process because they're the same size, easy to substitute one for the other. However, you can also have transversions, purine to pyrimidine, A to T, or vice versa, C to G. Uh, now, transversions are not favored by the mutational process because they're different sizes. So the transition rate isn't going to be equal to the transversion rate. Furthermore, transitions are less likely to change the encoded amino acid, whereas transversions are more likely to change the encoded amino acid. So therefore, natural selection, because the sequences we're looking at have a function in the virus as an amino acid, uh, natural selection is going to play a role in determining the transition transversion rate. And the reason for this, of course, is the codon table that uh, we saw earlier. Now, for example, here you can look at lysine, uh, which can be encoded by uh, two codons, AAA and AAG. Now, if at this third codon position, uh, you happen to go start at AAA and you have a transition, you will go to AAG and still encode for lysine. However, if you experience a transversion substitution at this third position, uh, you can go from AAA to AAC or AAU, which brings you to a different amino acid. Now, because natural selection uh, typically loathes to see any change, uh, this new protein with this new amino acid will probably uh, result in a virus that is less fit. Therefore, transversions are going to be disfavored by natural selection. Now, the substitution model that we use uh, in HIV trace is known as the Temura Day 93 model, which, uh, as you might be able to guess, uh, was uh, proposed by two gentlemen named Timora and Ney in a paper they wrote in 1993. That's how we like to name our models in evolutionary biology. Now, the TN93 model has three substitution rates, purine to purine, pyrimidine to pyrimidine, and purine to pyrimidine, or pyrimidine to purine. So, three substitution rates. And all base frequencies, A, C, T, and G, are estimated independently. And the question you might be asking is, okay, why not just use a simpler model? I've heard of some of them, like, say, Jukes Cantor, uh, or JC69, which, of course, was published by two people, Jukes and Cantor, in 1969. Now, this was the first substitution model, but I don't think it's appropriate for use for HIV sequences, and the reason is that it doesn't account for unequal base frequencies, and as we saw in the HXB2 genome, HIV has lots of unequal base frequencies with high levels of A. It also doesn't account for differences between transitions and transversions. So we lose a little bit of biological realism. So we're going to skip that model. Now you may think, well, in the past, I've seen HIV studies that use a model called Kimura 2 parameter. Now this model allows for differences in the transition and transversion rate. And now I understand that that's good because that's some important level of biological realism. However, the K2P model does now not account for uneven base frequencies. And from what you've seen so far in this talk, I'm sure you can now convince me that you don't want to use an HIV substitution model that doesn't account for unequal base frequencies. Now, for some reason, K2P is still very common in the HIV literature. Now, this is unjustified and uh, likely exists for uh, historical reasons. But the important message that I just would like to impart to you right now, uh, listener of this talk, is 
do not use the K2P model for HIV molecular evolutionary analyses. And you know why. Because it doesn't allow for unequal base frequencies, and HIV has unequal base frequencies. Now, you may ask yourself, why don't I use a more complicated model? I've heard of one called the General Time Reversible Model, or GTR model. And that allows site-to-site -site variation using the gamma parameter or this I, or invariant sites parameter. That's true. It does allow substitution rate to vary across sites and is more realistic. However, this model doesn't improve distance estimation under about 5% divergence. And in HIV molecular epidemiology, we're concerned with uh, divergences around 1.5%. So if we don't need to use a more complicated model, we're not going to, because we have a lot of sequences in HIV surveillance, and we don't want to waste time on a more complicated model that's not giving us any improvement. So now we have an alignment and can estimate genetic distance. But first, let's build a tree. Now, I'd just like to say phylogenetic trees are awesome. I uh, spend my doctoral dissertation building and analyzing phylogenetic trees. Phylogenetic trees have shown us that HIV-1 has jumped into humans on at least four separate occasions. Phylogenetic trees have shown us that HIV-1 group M started diversifying in humans in the early 20th century in and around Kinshasa, uh, what was then Zaire and is now the DRC. And phylogenetic trees have shown us how HIV made its way through North America via Haiti as a stepping stone. Also, phylogenetic trees can help us answer what I would consider to be one of the most fundamental questions in all of biology, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Simple. You take all of the species that lay eggs, you build a tree, and you can see that the egg existed on the base of the tree before turtles, lizards, snakes, crocodiles, and birds diverged from each other, whereas the chicken appeared only recently. So, Phylogenetically speaking, it's pretty unambiguous. The egg appeared long before the chicken. So, like I said, phylogenetic trees are awesome. Phylogenetic trees, uh, as an example, uh, can be shown here from a recent publication uh, by Mike Warby in 2017, uh, showing the ancestor of all of HIV-1 uh, in North America. Now, you can see all of the uh, sequences uh, from uh, California, Georgia, and New York uh, are shown in, uh, in darker colors, whereas HIV from the Caribbean is shown in gold. And by reading back through the tree, you can see that all of the sequences from uh, the United States uh, exist at a particular point in the tree uh, where they share a common ancestor, and they are all more closely related to each other than they are to the sequences from the Caribbean. And that lets us show uh, when HIV-1 start diversifying within uh, the United States. Now, HIV phylogenetic trees, for, the per for our purposes, actually may not be that important because, as you can see, they spend a lot of time reconstructing this internal branching structure. That's where most of the effort is spent, and very little time at the tips, where we would say have potential transmission partners, which are the primary focus of current HIV uh, molecular epidemiological approaches. Phylogenetic trees also spend a lot of time um, estimating support for internal nodes that, like I mentioned earlier, aren't necessarily the focus of HIV molecular epidemiology. So I'd like to say I come here not to bury phylogenetic trees, but to praise them. Most of the time uh, spent reconstructing phylogenies involve, involves uh, determining the internal branching structure, which is important for understanding deep evolutionary events. Tree shape and, no, and confidence can change when viral sequences are added. Uh, so when additional data is added, that can uh, change whether or not you would have support for a given relationship within the phylogeny. And the newer methods can easily handle thousands or even tens of thousands of viral sequences. Phylogenetic trees are awesome. But as far as HIV molecular epidemiology is concerned, transmission clusters are not concerned with the internal tree structure, only with the tips. And once we build a cluster, we want that 
cluster to exist in perpetuity. We want that cluster to be a cluster in all future analyses. We only want to be able to add people to transmission clusters. We don't want to lose them or subtract because we had more data. And finally, we need to be able to handle thousands or tens of thousands, or actually now hundreds of thousands of HIV sequences. And we don't have to start this analysis over every time. And therefore, for the purposes of molecular epidemiology, we actually don't use phylogenetic trees. And I'll get to that in a minute. But first, I'd like to summarize uh, everything you need to know from the genetic distance portion of this talk. First, genetic distance isn't always the same as percent identity. Two, TN93 substitution models allow for some biological realism when estimating genetic distance. And three, phylogenies aren't necessary when looking at very closely related HIV sequences. And this brings us to HIV trace. HIV trace is the HIV transmit, transmission cluster engine. And now, after sitting through uh, this talk, you are now experts in HIV molecular evolution, at least as it applies to HIV trace. So HIV trace will seem quite simple to you, and it is. Now HIV trace just does four things. Pairwise alignment to a reference sequence, pairwise genetic distance calculation, identification of potential transmission partners based on that genetic distance, and then cluster assembly. Now what are potential transmission partners? Well, they are people whose HIV genetic sequence is so similar as to imply a direct or indirect epidemiological link. And what I'll show you here are the genetic distance separating about 1,300 named HIV positive partners from New York City and the genetic distances that separate these partners. Now in blue, you see the named partners who were both infected with HIV that was highly genetically similar. And we termed them potential transmission partners. And in red, you can see the uh, genetic distance between potential transmit, uh, sorry, named partners who, while both being infected with HIV, are essentially genetically unrelated. The diversity that you see there between 0.04 and 0.08 uh, substitutions per site is essentially random within subtype B variation. So we would consider these individuals to be genetically unrelated partners. In HIV trace, we're interested in finding these potential transmission partners and separating them from all other comparisons. Now finally, the last terminology slide in this talk. Just a bit of network jargon for you. First, we have a node, which is a point or vertex in a network. In, in HIV trace, this is an HIV-infected person represented by their earliest viral genotype. We have an edge, which is a line connecting two nodes or an HIV trace, a connection denoting potential, but not necessarily direct, transmission partners. In a network, we have a cluster, which are connected components in the network, and where there exists a path connecting any two nodes within that cluster. In HIV trace, it's a connected group of potential transmission partners. Now, the network is the collection of nodes, some of which are connected by edges, in HIV trace, a person in the surveillance cohort connected to at least one potential transmission partner. There are different ways of describing nodes within our network. Uh, one of them is degree, which is the number of edges connecting a node, or the number of potential transmission partners for a given person. And of course, all of this is going to be uh, defined based on genetic distance, which is the measure of genetic divergence between two nucleotide sequences. Or for HIV trace, think about it as the strength of the inferred epidemiological link. Well, this is what we're going to try to infer. Here we have a node or point in our network. These nodes are connected by edges. These nodes are then combined into clusters. And the entirety of what we're considering is the transmission network. And of course we can describe nodes based on their degree or how many edges uh, they have coming out of them. And of course, these uh, connections are defined based on genetic distance. So how does HIV trace work? Well, first, parallelize alignment to reference sequence. We take all of our sequences and we align each of them to the HXB2 reference sequence, like that. It's almost just that fast. Once we have our alignment, we then 
compute the pairwise kinetic distance between all pairs of sequences. So all sequences against every other sequence. And we end up with a list of sequences. So we have genetic distance between A and B, A and C, A and D, A and E, etc. We then identify potential transmission partners uh, in this list, which for the purposes of HIV trace are individuals with a genetic distance less than or equal to 0 0.015 substitutions per site. So we've now identified all of our potential transmission partners, AB, AC, B to C, and D to E. Once we've identified our potential transmission partners, we then assemble them into clusters. So we take all of these nodes that would be in our network and we put them on a graph and we then connect them based on their genetic distance. So A to B, A to C, B to C, and D to E. And now we have assembled two distinct transmission clusters uh, using HIV trace. Now that's how HIV trace works and it really is that simple. HIV trace finds potential transmission partners and assembles these partners into genetic clusters. And I hope you'll agree with my second point here that HIV trace is easy to understand. So now you know how to build a genetic transmission network using uh, HIV uh, molecular sequence data. Thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to email me at jwertheim at ucsd.edu. Thank you.